So I bet if I asked you to tell me about narration, you would think of three ways to narrate. Oral, written, or drawn. But what if I told you there were a bunch of other ways? Hey, welcome back to The Commonplace. I'm your host, Autumn Kern. And today, I'm going without my glasses, which I actually do need all the time, but I, I feel like there's a really terrible glare back to you, which I would find annoying as a viewer. And so if it, if it looks like I'm kind of going like this on you. It's probably because I am. But we are going to talk about narration today. And that is kind of the theme of the two weeks. So last week on the podcast, I covered narration. We talked about what it is, why you do it. I sort of went through the FAQs of narration. What do I do if I have multiple students? Aren't discussion and narration kind of the same thing? Why do I have to narrate after a single reading? Those sorts of questions that people generally come to narration with, that's what we covered in the podcast. And I'll link that below so you can go and listen. But what I promised to do in the podcast for YouTube this week was talk about a bunch of other ways that you can narrate. And I think it's important to know them because one, we should know these things as mother teachers. Two, sometimes when you have a kid that's struggling with a narration, it might be helpful to change up the type of narration you're doing. And then three, one of the things I repeatedly see through Mason's work and then through the parents review articles is that catching children a little bit off guard, in a sense, kind of changing things up on them so they don't know when they'll be narrating or how they'll be narrating is actually a good tool for a mother teacher to have. And so I have a list compiled today. We're going to run through it. I'm actually making or have really actually already made, but we'll be sharing in Patreon tonight, um, a, a like narration at a glance guide. And if I can figure out how to do it, I'll show it to you right here. I think I figured it out. Do you guys see it? Anyways, it's just a quick overview for music and art, which is specifically the type of narrations we'll be talking about today, a list of what you can do. I'm gonna explain what each one is in this video, but that way you can just put it in your binder, tack it up on your bookshelf, wherever you kind of do your schooling, and you have a couple reminders there, a couple of key things to focus on by grade for the skill that's being learned by the students there, and then also all these different types of narrations that you can use. And that will be available in Patreon, a link below, we love Patreon. Okay, so this list is kind of a compilation of some of my favorite resources, some older moms that I've talked to, a good bit from Karen Glass in her book, Know and Tell, and then of course from the CMEC. So I've gathered these from many places. I don't want you to think I figured these all out on my own because I didn't. And that's why I love the classical tradition. Just build on top of build on top of wonderful wisdom before you. So narration. Let's talk about it. So with art and music or your fine arts or your truth, beauty, goodness, depending on what you call these things, there are there are many ways that children can interact with the pieces because they're looking at art and they're looking at music. And so if you've never tried to narrate a piece of music, you'll find that you kind of sit there like, well, what do I do? Um, I found that when I did this just a couple weeks ago, I tried to narrate a piece from Brahms. Most of us in this group kept going to stories we were making up about it. Like it sounds like a couple who's dancing, and they're not really sure where they're at right now. There really hasn't been a DTR yet. Like we were kind of describing it in story form. And that is actually a pretty common way that children will also narrate things like this. In fact, I have, um, I know someone, her boys will narrate things with like sea creatures. So it'll be like, well, then this big angry shark came in and you know, that's when the music's getting really, really loud. And, um, but then the little, the little guppies came by, kind of get softer. And so you'll find that when you're working with art, the narrations kind of take a different spin than they might when you tell back what you've just read or have heard read to you by your mother. So you, of course you still have the oral ones and you still have the written ones. You might just write something in your book. You might or, um, orally narrate something as a group. You might take turns. You may be describing, it sounds like these colors. It sounds like this. And that's totally fine. But when you get stuck, or if you just want to engage a child's imagination in a slightly different way, then these are some things that you can try. Now, the first is the creative written narration. And that would be taking something like a piece of music or a piece of art, because these do overlap, these lists you'll find. Um, and you would make something like a poem or a dialogue or write a letter to express it. And you you want to be careful that you don't make this a creative writing exercise. This should always be like offered as an optional thing a child can do, but it gives them the ability to take something like a music piece and write a letter maybe from maybe from a book character that they know or maybe from someone they've studied in history and kind of explain the piece that way. The second set are the list of observations and the list of questions. So if you have many students in a co-op or if you have a couple kids at home, you can work together to come up with a list of observations. Keep a, you know, a note on the chalkboard, write them down in their, in their narration notebooks, whatever you want to do, but just write down all the things they see and see if they can build off one another. The same can be true for questions. What questions do you have about the piece? What does it mean? Why does it alternate in this way? 
What might they want to ask the artist? How do they think it was received the first time it was played? And then you can keep this long list of observations or questions and it encourages the child to continue to build on it as well as find the answers for it as they study this piece over a couple weeks. So the next one would be comparison. Now you might take two pieces from the same time period or from the same artist or the same genre or the same idea. So it could be literally two pieces from the same time period that you compare, or it could be two battle scenes from two different time periods that you compare. And a student will be able to find um, interesting connections between the artists, between the styles, between the content. I do want to make this pretty clear, this is not something you do with very young children. If you have very young children like I do, they are supposed to just kind of um, be fully immersed in the painting. They don't necessarily work to this degree yet, but this is also a really good reminder that narration skills continue to grow. Now the next thing, and I really enjoy this one, is the tableau. So a tableau, you use all the kids in your family or your co-op and they actually reenact something. So you give them a certain amount of time, they can find you know, blankets or pillows or a funny hat from the entryway and whatever they can make a costume out of best they can or set up a scene. And so they recreate what they've seen in the painting. And there are a couple ways you can do this. The group can work together, you can assign one child to be the director and they kind of tell the other students where to go. You could give them a short amount of time, a longer amount of time, depending on how detailed you want them to be. But again, the primary consideration here is that it is not teacher design, like you as the mother teacher have not set this up and told the students what to do. It has to be student directed. They need to do this because that is the practice of narration. And then they may even come back after something like that and make a couple a couple new observations in their notebooks after you know actually embodying the piece of art. Um, and what's interesting about narration, like I said in the podcast, when you start to narrate, you typically notice what sort of holes you've had on what you've seen that you didn't realize at the time because you thought you were getting everything thing. Um, and in all these different types of narrations, you touch on a different skill. So if you're going to redraw something like a, a piece of art, you really notice um, maybe the angles and the lines and the dimensions and how the, the painting can be broken up in three parts with equal people in each part, things like that. When you are um, thinking about props and something like a tableau, you're thinking about the colors and what they were wearing and the details of how they stood, what positions their bodies were, were their eyes pointed this way or were their eyes pointed that way. So you kind of focus in on different details, which is really interesting when you think about how you might mix these narration skills, you're actually going to deeply impress those details in the minds of a child. Actually, you don't deeply impress them, the child does it, which is, of course, the point of education. Bouncing off that, you could always act out a scene, you could build a diorama, again, as detail-oriented or not, depending on how much time you have and what kind of like resources you just have available, a child can do quite a bit with just a little, which is fun. A couple more that I really like, that are kind of more specific to art, but I do think they can overlap again with music, one would be the tell me how to draw it. And so you would have all the kids at your table all dictate to you what you need to do, and you draw on a board or on a piece of paper exactly what they say. And so it's very fun to listen to kids be like, no, 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 wait, which way is this head turned? You know, like that, that sort of thing. And you just draw exactly what they say. You don't add to it. Remember, one of the reminders about narration is that you are silent during it. And so you allow them to work together and you are the person who just draws it. Now, another thing would be color matching and color blocking. So particularly with something like music, you may pick a color that represents a particular sound in the piece or a section of the piece. And then you would narrate out by using that color. Okay. The first section was this color and then this color came in but then it went back to the first section and you would actually map it out by color which can be a very very good way to narrate for kids who think in terms of colors and ideas in that way and it makes a very beautiful notebook entry as well and then the last two which i guess i would say are also a bit more for music in my head i don't have them as separate as i do on my pdf for the patrons today but i think these would particularly be for music so one would be using the score so actually the music itself now if you have young kids who play instruments or are interested in following along with the music Music and looking at the score, they can narrate into their journals their actual favorite pieces of the score. So they use the score to narrate if they're able to read the music and visualize, which um, for the young for the young musician is is a really neat way to do that. And then there's the composition sketch, which I, which I think is really cool when I've seen it done well. <laughs> I say that because I can't do this yet, but I'm hoping to work on this skill. So this can actually be done when your student is listening to the music. They can kind of start working on this, but basically they draw a, they draw something for each section of the piece and then they map it out based on what they hear. So they would do something for the main theme. They would mark where they hear it, when it grows louder, why it grows quieter, when it disappears, when it gets muddled, when it comes back. I actually listened to a woman explain her narration for a piece of music and she had just been drawing little, little like sketches 
as she was listening. And what she noticed was there was a rhythmic pattern into how the piece was structured because she could actually see it in her notebook. Otherwise she wouldn't have picked up on a kind of like a harmonious um, bringing together of sounds, which is just really interesting because you could listen and you could narrate something really well, but totally miss that if you weren't using this particular type of narration. So I hope that helps. It's just some new ideas, um, something to expand the narration skill set, also to enjoy it in different ways. Of course, your kids are going to have unique skills and unique interests and unique ways of engaging with music and art. That's kind of the point. But um, these are just good to keep in the back of your notebook, write them down on a note card, or even come join Patreon and get the printable along with all the other resources that we have in there. So I hope this helps. I'm going to be back with our next principal video for principles. I think it's 11 and 12, the science of relations. I'm gonna be talking about how you lay the feast in the early years pre-formal school. So even if you have that formal student, but you got a couple coming up behind them, or if you are like many of my listeners, you got a two and three year old, but you're starting to prepare now. We're gonna talk about what you can do to lay the feast in the early years in a way that is not formal school, but is life-giving to everyone. So I hope you'll be back for that. Go ahead and hit subscribe, and then I'll see you next time.